listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I gotta tell you something, people. I'm, uh, I'm getting old. I hate to admit it. I'm not getting old, whereas, you know, tucking a polo shirt into pleated dockers, going to the early bird special old. But I'm getting to the point where I'm, I just turned 56. And the other night, I sat there and I was all excited because actually the next morning I was excited because I didn't wake up and have to use the bathroom overnight. So that's what happens when you get old. Anyway, we have a great show today. We have a gentleman who's a, uh, he's a successful comic, actor, writer, director. I believe he grew up in the town of the, uh, where the famous Tower Theater is located. And my guest is Jamie Kennedy. How you doing, Jamie? What's up, man? Hey, so, How are you, brother? So you're, you, are you, are you from Upper Darby? Yes, born and raised. Now, now let's Delco. What's your take on Delco? Because I see a lot of, you know, I live outside Philadelphia. I grew up in Cherry Hill. I live back in the area now. And a lot of people give Delco a hard time. What was your take on Delco growing up as a kid? Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Cherry Hill. Oh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It's just... Uh, Delco is a place that you really don't know what it's like until you leave it. You know, I equate it to its own little bubble. And the things there, when you're in it, you kind of think it's weird. You kind of think it's different. You kind of think it's a little off. Um, and then you leave, and then you realize... Yeah, it's more off than you realize. <laughs> I, I equate it to a place that has like tainted water. <laughs> so, what? Uh, when did you? You know, I think you left. What, when did you leave? How old were you when you left? Nineteen years old. Just <laughs> turned nineteen. Okay. Now, now, when did you start getting interested in, in acting and comedy? And why didn't you hang out in the Philly area for a while? Because Philly had a pretty good stand-up scene. So, so you start the journey, you move to L.A. at 19, which is, you know, that's pretty ballsy. I mean, a lot of people don't go across country at that age. What was your goals when you, where did you start off? What was your goals when you got to L.A.? Um, well, like I was taking a local acting class in Philly, and from that, I got to meet a person who got me to go on the set of Dead Poets Society and I got to be an extra for two days, which was incredible. So Dead Poets Society was filming in Delaware and I was like, this is the most incredible thing. So then I said, I gotta go to where they do all of these movies. Where do they do that? They do it to LA. And my goal was to move out to LA and try to work as an extra. And I said, I can do this job and kind of, you know, find a little place to sleep and just kind of figure out what what's this, what is this journey all about? I had nothing. I had no idea about success, SAG, any of that. I just wanted to move to LA to try to try to do this extra work thing. That's weird. No, it's just crazy because a lot of people, you know, when they're in LA, they become extras. A lot of people don't move out to be extras. When you got out here in LA, did you start getting extra work right away? No. Um, it was very hard. Um, it's very competitive. Um, I think a lot of people don't go out, uh, out into L.A. or New York with with the right mindset, you know. And I was lucky because I had a mindset of just trying to figure it out, just try to find it out. So, you know, I want to keep, to say I was ballsy at 19, I really didn't have anything else. Well, what I've been doing, going to college, getting debt, or getting married, and potentially becoming a bad husband. I mean, like to me, it was the exact, the exact thing I was supposed to do. And I think that when I went out there, I people go out there and have these crazy. 
crazy ideas and dreams. And so for me, it was very simple to start small, and I had no idea what I was going to do. And it's very, very, very competitive as an extra because more people do it as a job for sidecast. So you got teachers, you know, mothers, students. So I had to get a job as a wait as a waiter and another job too. And that's when I learned about the whole business through a woman. Now, who was that? She told me. Her name was Rhonda. You know, I forget her last name. Rhonda Slesno. Rhonda Slesno. That's good. She's incredible. It's like, you know, you could meet these angels along the way. She was an angel. And she had done a couple of guest spots on TV. And she had told me very early on, she's like, you do not want to be an extra. You want to be an actor. She's like, you're funny. She's like, you're different. You're weird. Become an actor. I'm like, what's an actor? She's like, this is what an actor does. This is how you go about it. She's like, you have to be an actor. She really kept telling me that. And that I was like, okay, maybe I can do that. But it was very weird to understand what it was. So what's your path to become an actor then? Because did you sit there and start taking acting classes? I mean, did you sit there? Because, you know, if you're doing background work and you're also waiting tables, you're used to having some money coming in. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of scary if you don't have a lot of money coming in when you live in L.A. Yeah, I mean, you know, if anybody's listening to this that wants to do it, it's, it's a lot different now. But, you know, there's no risk, no reward. You know, it is very scary. It's It's... It's very depressing, but it's also very exhilarating to do something that you care about. And so there were days that were very, very, very depressing, and there was other days that were very exhilarating. So she took me on the path of explaining to me what the business is. And so she told me what a headshot was. I never, she told me what a resume is. She said how to lie in your resume. She told me what bookstore to go to she told me how to mail out resumes she told me what casting directors were she told me how to do so she really took me along she told me what cold reading workshops were she so it was really a learning process but i was so damn excited that i was my whole days were busy just buying staplers and envelopes and getting pictures there's a whole to do did you ever get she showed me did you ever go to the Show me the beginning ropes. I'm did, sorry, what? I said, did you ever go to the Samuel French bookstore to get uh, scripts and stuff like that? Of course, it's mandatory. It's, uh, no, it's, the, it's the, the Mecca. Isn't that crazy? She's the one who told me. Isn't that crazy she's how... the one who told me. Okay. Yeah. It's crazy exactly. how that was such a popular place, and now because of the internet, it's not. And so much... It, that had such a... Because I lived in L.A. for a long time. Samuel French had such a good vibe. You know, you walked in, and you felt creative. When you look at a book, you know, when you look at a screenplay or a, or a play, it really said... That was like older Hollywood. Yeah, it's gone. There was two of them. There was one on Sunset, and there was one in Studio City, and they're both gone. So you're, you're, uh -huh. you're really excited about acting now when do you start getting your first break do you start getting all how long does it take you to start getting auditions and get an agent how long was that whole process um, it took me about a year to figure out how to go about the business the first year was just me like figuring out how to live out on my own and all the stuff and figuring it out and then within about nine months Within about six months, I started finding about headshots, and I started doing all that stuff. Um, and then within a year, I really wasn't getting anything. And so right before I turned 20, when I was 19, I had a job delivering coffee at ABC. I was doing a lot of jobs you know, just to keep alive. And I worked with somebody and he kept telling me I gotta try stand-up comedy I gotta try stand-up comedy I was like how do I do that what is that and they're like you just gotta try it because you would send out like 30 pictures right and then you would have you know you would just wait you know you'd buy a drama log you'd try to go to an audition <laughs> and 
and you would just wait, you know, you would, you know, try to make a tape somewhere, and you would just wait, you were just all this waiting, and you are just like, I can't wait, so comedy was self-active, self-generating thing, and they were like, it's a good way to be seen, so I started that in around 1990, and and it was, you know, that was a whole new journey along with trying to act and stuff. So I really didn't, it took me probably about four and a half to five years to really start getting some inroads. Yeah. I mean, I was I was auditioning for drama log, non-union, sketchy things, student film, grad student, uh, good colleges. And I moved up to like USC. You know, so like USC was like, it's really good. I couldn't get an agent for a long time. So it just started slowly going like that. So you start, you start getting work. You start, you know, if you look at IMDb, you start getting some spots on sitcoms and, you know, guest spots or back. What was your first spot besides, I mean, not being background uh, or extra. What was your first paid gig that was actually a legit production? One of my one of my like first, second or third gigs was a movie called The Road to Flin Flon. And I was unknown and the producers saw me at the Laugh Factory on Sunset and they brought me in audition and then I auditioned again and I auditioned again. And it was like one of those those moments where you know you're in Hollywood, it's like a the office with a plant and a pile of videotapes <laughs> and um, bam I got it and I got it I got the lead dude like the co-lead which is insane it was in 1994 and it was just beautiful training because I was just this young impressionable thing and it was a totally independent movie shot over about 30 days in in um, Hollywood, and it was, you know, one of those things where a lot of the times when I was starting out, I was able to audition for something, and people would hire me just based off my audition, you know, I was just unknown, but I was really good at what I did, you know, and so that was how I kind of lived my life, you know, I didn't play the game, I didn't go to politics, I if I became someone's friend, it became naturally. I didn't try to work the party circuit. I, I would go if I was in something, you know. So that was my first thing in '94. But the movie really didn't go anywhere. But it gave me a lot of, a lot of uh, experience. And then from there, I was able to get tape. And then I got an audition for a Vans commercial. And then that was one that saw me on TV. It was in like the summer of 94. I was on TV, on MTV a lot, doing the band sneaker commercials, and that was really helpful. What was that like, though, when you first start seeing yourself on TV? Is it the first time you're really excited, then after a while you're like, Jesus Christ, there I am again? These are really good questions. These are what people should ask when they do interviews, because you're going step by step. It's It was very weird. Um, I remember being in the editing bay and seeing myself come up. I'm like, that's me. That's so weird. My nose looks big. My ears look weird. My hair is too long. I just thought I looked like weird. Um, it was really weird. Then when you see yourself, I don't even think I owned a TV at that point. I think maybe I did, but my friends did. And so they would tape it. <laughs> And then when I was on, remember, this is 1994, they would have it on, and they would tape it to have it on, and then, like, try to play the tape back for me. There was no call, it was maybe a calling, there was no texting, there was no instant snapping, there was none of that. So, it was like, yo, man, I think I saw you earlier, I think I taped it. Like, because you would hear what shows it was going to play on, the commercial. Well, it must have been good for you, though, because if it was a national, then you probably started getting a little bit of a uh, steady revenue coming into you. Yeah, I make good money. Um, I 
made about like six thousand dollars that summer, which is a lot of money. And so I went from like you know making like busboy and waiter catering money to that. And yeah, it was just good because then I was able to call and get people to say, "Yo, he's on a commercial now, see him." So there was there wasn't a lot of young programming back then, you know, like. Now you got programming for everybody, from babies all the way up to geriatric people. But then it was just like Saved by the Bell and, and, and MTV. Those were the only two younger programs. But the CW, which was the WB, was trying to get in the younger programming. And that's how I started getting little jobs because I was able to audition for shows there. And that started happening. So you're so you're sitting there. You're finally you're you know you're starting to get work. You're feeling you're getting some heat. You know you're actually working. You can you can keep away from the waiting and stuff like that. And then Scream comes along. What was your process in getting in Scream? And did you think that that movie would pretty much change your life? Um, Scream was something I saw the breakdown because I used to get them illegally. And then I got an agent by this point. I called my agent. She said, "What submitted you?" I got to go in um, on an on audition. I did really well. And the cash worker said, I'm going to bring you back Thursday to meet Mr. Craven. I was like, no way. She's like, yes. So, you know, every time you do stuff like this, you wait. You know, you you know, you know, don't go to sleep. You're two days and you're just thinking of your next one, your next one. Um, and then I did that. And then he said, good job, but he's really hard to read, so I didn't know. And then I went, and I started, you know, I got another job, and I was away from that job for a little bit, for like a month. I was starting to work, and then they had the callbacks for Scream, which were weird, because I was coming back to audition for another movie, and they said, oh yeah, Scream wants to see you, but it was kind of like a left a last minute thing like oh yeah Scream wants to see you I was like oh yeah this is like oh yeah I'm like oh yeah you mean Scream oh yeah you were gonna tell me she's like oh, yeah well I was gonna tell you I just kinda flipped my mind I'm like oh yeah so I went and I looked very different and my hair was lighter and I went in and I auditioned and I think I did good screen tested and then I had to wait and I was Kept being told I was in the final ten and the final eight and the final. Ten. Kept being pared down, you know. People, it was a it was, it was like this unknown. The great thing about Scream is it's, it's the way people break. You know what I'm saying? You have to think about it. You, you got to think about how this works. You know, like I'll try to give you a simple answer here. How people become stars sometimes, most of the time, a lot of times is by unconventionalness, right? So, a studio movie that's like kind of like a hundred million dollar movie, it's very hard to get the lead in that if you're unknown. I mean, it does happen, right? But you either come up by grinding and different things in a part here and a part there and you work your way up, or you make something that's outside the box. And that's what Scream was. Scream was this unconventional little movie that no one knew what the fuck it was. But it was completely different, completely original, completely genre bending. And it had one name attached to it, which was Courtney Cox. And then it had Drew Barrymore, but only actually Drew. Drew, I think, was the first person. She was, and she was going to play Killed, which I thought was crazy. And then Courtney, I believe, was that. And everybody else was kind of coming up and no one would be new. You know, Nev was on Party 5 and such. So, we, we were all kind of young, kind of unknown. Um, you know, I remember hearing that about Twilight, but Twilight at least had those book sales. But there was a lot of unknown people in that, and so you, 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 it, you know, after you know, like a month and a half, my agent's like, I think you got this role, and then, but they kept wanting a name, they kept wanting a name, and uh, Jason 
Lee was somebody they really, really wanted. He had done a ton of movies and he had done James, you know, and uh, all that and stuff. And, and uh, I believe Seth Green was in the mix, another Philly guy, because he had so much more experience than me. But, you know, to Wes's credit, he really liked me. He said, you know, I know no one knows this guy, but I believe in him. I think he's just, you know, I think he's great for this. So I want him. And that's how it happened. So and, uh, how did your life change? the movie becomes a hit. Like, I mean, it it was one of those things that, as you said, no one was expecting a big, uh, to become as big as it did. How does your life change? Because you're, you're, as you said, you're you're still somewhat an unknown, but all of a sudden you're on the screen and you're on the screen in a movie that's a hit. Um, yeah, like I remember a year and a half before that I was with my girlfriend and it dumped me and we went to Man's Chinese, and she's like, you're gonna be up there. I don't know how, but you're gonna be up there within the next year or two. And I was like, how? She's like, I don't know. She's like, dump me anyway. And then I remember, I remember going to the premiere in Westwood, and, and it was a big premiere. And so we had two screens. We had two different screening rooms. And I went in the one room, and it was like a lot of the bigger names. And then the second room was like me and some smaller names. And they, both the rooms were reacting great. And I thought, oh my God, this is interesting. So my life changed when I went to Colorado that Christmas with my parents and my family. I went skiing, a little ski trip. And someone recognized me at Sushi. It was the first time I'd ever recognized this in Colorado. And I was like, yeah, that's me. And she's like, oh my God, can I have your autograph? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, oh my God. It was like literally that moment, you know. Um, it was very weird because, you know, basically how it changes, you become hot, right? It's a movie that the world sees, but then it became a movie that the town sees. And then it's up for an MTV Awards, up for Critics' Choice Awards, up for all these things. So, you start going out there and your visibility and all of a sudden you're part of this hot thing. So you start getting, you know, more auditions and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I wasn't getting offers, but I was getting high end auditions and I started getting jobs. Now, now what kind of roles were you, I know an actor will take roles, you know, especially then you're newer, but what, what kind of roles were you, hoping for because you know you ended up working with some really great people but you know what were some of the roles that you wanted when you were after screen when you had some juice in hollywood were there certain kind of roles you went after did you sit there and go i want to i want to tell your agent i want to do this kind of role or did you just say whatever comes in i'm going to audition for it? um yeah i mean i had a i had a young agent and she was pretty hip and she was you know believed in me and so she had gotten me like this comedic, quirky movie. This uh, guy named Darren Stein who eventually did a movie called Jawbreaker. Um, I had gotten another movie called Star Struck. And that went to the LA Film Festival. We thought that was going to give me some heat. And it didn't really do anything for me. And then um, in the 90s, there was some indies, you know, so indies were, you know, I did another movie called Clock Watchers, and I was like the only guy in that. It was Lisa Kudrow and Parker Posey, Tony Gallet, and that went to Sundance. Um, but I really didn't get any heat off of that. But at least I was working with the cool '90s kids. Um, but I didn't really have a choice. You know, it was about just getting out there being on set and learning. I was I was learning how to swim, you know. Um, it's just I had a big hit called The Box. But, you know, I was getting into Tony. I, I, I wanted, I thought I was a part of a, a, a major movie and I thought, well, hey man, I'm one of the reasons this movie's a success, you know, but like my agents just thought, well, you're young, you can keep working. But, you know, I would have liked them to have taken me a little bit more seriously at that point. But I mean, I was working and getting out there and great movies but I had to go and fight there was never like any exclusivity with me which you know 
probably could have hurt me a little bit. Well, as an actor, you know, you know, when you were in the hit Scream, you probably saw a sequel coming up, which there was. Does that make it a little easier, take a little pressure off you? Because, you know, the actors are always looking for their next job. But if you're in a hit and they're sitting there talking about your second, you know, Scream 2, that must take a little bit of pressure off you because you know something's coming up. Well, it's funny, man, because it's like, at the time I had this lawyer, she's super powerful, and she still is, but she was just always saying no and tough negotiations, and I didn't really have a say, and she didn't walk me through the process, and she's a huge lawyer, but it was just, like, scary to be with her, because she was just constantly just, like, you know, somebody would ask for a dollar, and she'd ask for a hundred, you know, I was like, yo, like, <laughs> And you don't want to lose a job. And you're like, I don't know you that well. Like, this is how it works. And blah, blah, blah. But she had other huge clients that so she could do that, you know. So I never knew there was going to be a sequel. No one ever knew there was going to be a sequel. It was only after the movie was a hit. And I had done As Good As It Gets. And I had done another little indie. And it was like, it was like maybe... February of 07, I had worked enough, had a girlfriend, and we went to Tulum, Mexico, which is now a hot place, but back then it was still undiscovered. And uh, thank you, you're welcome. And so I go there, and it was hard for me to take a break, but I did. And then my agent at the time called me and said they might do a sequel to Scream. And I said, okay. And they said, but I don't think you're in it. And I go, I don't think I am either. And I go, but why not? <laughs> and they're like, I don't know. It was more like the three of them, right? And I was like, I'm like, well, I'm not dead. And then I guess it was being written. And then somehow... They, I was talking to the producers and they said, yeah, we believe Randy's going to be written in. And then he was writing the script and then sure enough, they wrote it and they wrote a really, really, really juicy role for me. And so it was only then when the first offers came in that I feel that, like what you were saying, that security, and I went from a little to a lot more. Um, but, you know... I only got partial script because, you know, they were writing it and they were figuring out who the killer was, who was going to die. And so, yeah, I had no idea it was going to be a sequel. Then I had no idea it was going to be in it. Then I know I had no idea it was going to live. So, yes, it was good. And then, no, it was crazy to die. But it was okay to die because I didn't think Scream would keep going. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> so, so you're acting, you know, I know you were in Three Kings. What was that like? Because that's like, you know, where, you, where did that shoot? Um, that shot in Arizona. And uh, that was just incredible. It was another, it was like the way Hollywood used to be, where you would go in, you would audition, you know, the director would work with you, we'd play with you, we'd have some fun, you'd go out, you know, you'd have a cup of coffee, you'd have you come back in. It was like work. That's when auditions used to be the best when they were a work session. They were warm and friendly. Now it's just a different time. Now it's just, just weird, man. Now, now at, during this time, were you still doing stand-up at all or did you not have the time to do it? No, I was pretty busy, so I didn't really have the time to go and have an act and go to the clubs, but I was doing... I think I took off from like 95 to 98. I took off like three, three years. And towards the end of 98, middle 98, I started working again. And I started opening with some bigger names because I had had time and I thought to myself, I saw, I, I saw that Dave Chappelle was, he was in a lot of movies at the time and I saw his name at a comedy club and I remember him always saying like, you can like write jokes in your trailer and I thought yeah that's a really good point like you can do that and, and I thought oh maybe I could be again because I was had time again I mean like, you 
you're kind of waiting. You're like waiting to get an audition. You know, when you're on the, on the set, you're waiting for your scene, and your scene sometimes, if they're not hard, you can do stuff. You know. Now, now so, you, oh, go ahead. That's what so I started doing it again. Well, now you're doing stand up, and uh, now how did how did the Jamie uh, Kennedy experiment sh- come about? Because I had a lot of characters. My friend John Matter wrote for that. He's a Philly guy too. John Matter was. Uh, um, you know, I was doing movies and doing a lot of stuff, and then I was just waiting, you know, and it was like, I was kind of played the friend or the tech guy in a lot of movies, and then I was like, okay, and then I was like, now it was like my break to like get a comedy movie, and no one was really pushing me as the lead, there was a couple people, I could never get the the low budget comedy lead movie, so everyone was like, you know, what are we gonna do? And my agents are like, TV, 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 and I was like, I don't want to do TV, and they're like, oh, just do TV, and then you'll get hotter again, and there'll be movies. And so I had some TV development deals, and one of them was at the WB, and I said, if I'm gonna do it, this is what I want to do. I want to do my own sketch variety kind of show, and that's. So that show is on, and then eventually from that, and you did Malibu's Most Wanted, which I thought was a great movie. How did you come up with that character? Um, I came up with it because I'm from Philly and I'm for Darby, and there was always people that listened to to rap music and such, and they were just people that loved hip hop. But we weren't like out there, like fronting, you know what I mean? And then when I was in California, people were really acting really hardcore, but they were living in Beverly Hills or they were living in Brentwood, you know. And I was like, this is not the city, you know. It was basically a juxtaposition of like city music in super suburban life. And then I thought, where could be the most, this is becoming like a phenomenon. Where would be the most outrageous place to be? And uh, that's when I came up with the Malibu idea. Now, what's it like to write a script for yourself when you're all of a sudden writing a screenplay? Do you really have to pour yourself into it because it's you working it out, or is it easier to write because you know you're the one who's going to be acting it? So you're working, you're you're starring a movie you wrote, you're on TV, you know, you have a really good go- career, and then you branch off and you do the, the documentary Heckler, which was, was great, and I, I had I did stand up professionally from 88 to 95, and I know exactly, you know, what the business is like. What made you decide to do Heckler, and was, was it something that was really close to your heart because you said, you know what, fuck these people who, you know, are just pains in the ass? I did it because uh, people were so, it was just weird, you know, I was, I was in clubs and tape, I was taping myself a lot, I was about to do my first special, and um, people would hackle, would say things and be disruptive, but they were pretty funny when I'd watch it back, the interactions, so I started stringing those together, and I started watching that, and I was with my friend at the director, and he's like, I think we can do something with this, and I was like, yeah, and then at the time, online was really starting to take off in terms of, like, comments and feedbacks and blogs and YouTube, and people were, like, leaving comments about everything. You 
you couldn't read about yourself. You couldn't read about how much people hated you before that. And I was just, I don't know, I think it was the cultural zeitgeist at the time. I mean, I think we're used to it now, but it was just, people don't understand that never existed. That never existed. If you did a movie, people would review it, and they would tell you if they liked the movie or not, or if they think you should see it. They wouldn't personally attack you. Like, but now, people attack you viciously, violently, ugly, not all the time, but sometimes, and then they comment about it, and it's just this crazy, crazy, crazy system, and so at that time, it was just, that was being formed in the internet, and I was one of, becoming a star, and I was also one of the people, when they would comment on it, it was just so overwhelming for me that I had to, like, kind of fight back, and that's, I wanted to learn what it was, that's why I did it, so... I did it because I realized we live in a very intense culture of criticism that, you know, people could avoid that criticism by avoiding the product in which they're criticizing. And I wanted to feel like I wasn't alone. And then when I went out to other artists who I really respected, I, I realized that I wasn't. So it made me feel a lot better about myself. Now, I, I must, you know, as you said, you know, it, it's something that people are vicious and people are mean and, and I just don't get it. And I mean, I guess because they want their fan fare. But for you, mentally, were, was, did you go start getting depressed? when? Because all you want to do is entertain people. That's all you're out for. And that's all people should ask for is entertainment. But for you, I mean, would you read something and would it just crush you? Or how would you keep rebounding? Because, I mean, people, people, you're right, can be mean. And if you're saying something really nasty, even though you can say I have a thick skin, it's got to bother you. Very much so. Um, I'm honest about it. I think a lot of people are not. Um, it was very painful. It was very uh, bothering. And um, anybody who says it doesn't affect them, I don't believe them. I could get to the soul of what they're saying because that's one of the reasons we do it. We do it for feedback and we want to be loved and we want to feel a connection with people. And you're right. All I wanted to do was take my brand of craziness because that's a little bit I'm a little crazy and I was entertaining and people loved it and then there's all these people that didn't like it and so I would think like it's not for you you know um, and it was very strange you know why are these people actively it's not so much that they don't like you which isn't great but you can get used to that it's that they don't want you to keep doing it and so it's almost affecting your livelihood and affecting your you know Doing what we do is like, for me, breathing, you know what I mean? It's like, I feel better when I create something. I feel better when I act in a scene. I feel better when I tell a joke. I feel better when I do a break dance move, you know? It's like I'm expelling something from my, from myself. And these people were like, you should never do it. And it was like, yo, you're stop. It's like, imagine stopping water from flowing, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people out there that do like it. I mean, I'm not crazy. I go to Man's Chinese and see myself in a movie and people are dying laughing. I'm clearly not crazy, but some dude in, uh, you know, Phoenix hates it. And it's like, well, what's your problem? So, and why are you spreading that? So, very painful. You do get depressed, and, uh, you know, you do a lot of things. I wasn't like a druggie or anything, but I was, you know, making the movie was one way to, to deal with the, that depression, actually. Now, did you ever, did you ever, or and to this day, did you ever lash back, or do you just think that, they're trolls, just leave them alone. They say their piece and then they're gonna disappear. Yeah, did you see the movie? Yeah, I mean I saw I it years ago. Back, I lashed back in the movie. No, I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about I'm talking about now, because Twitter is so big now. Uh yeah, it's kinda hard to fight. I mean like the big thing is is that people people there's this mob, you know, the thing with the mob is they need to be exposed. You know what I mean? So, like, I have done certain things. People holler at me for certain movies, or they, they'll they say, you know, New Year's special I did was weird, or this video game conference I did was weird. And, and you and you'll, so many people will talk shit about you, and then you'll, like, oh, hold on. That's not, it's not that they talk shit about you, which isn't great. It's that they spread lies about you fucking just lie saying you're drunk or you're on drugs or you're this or that you're like yeah that's not the case 
and then they attack you, and then they're all like, I mean, it is a good term. I mean, there, are, there is an underground thing of like these trolls, and they band together, and they fucking try to take you down because they feel that you're in a position that they're not, right? It's not always the case. There's constructive criticism too, but it's sometimes the case. And so then if you attack them back, they might jump on your back, and it's like you're fighting 90 of them. Right. And you just don't have the fucking time. So have I lashed back? Oh, you big time. I've said some ugly shit. I've said some... Like, I remember a couple years ago, a girl said some shit to me that I was flirting with her, and I'm like, I wasn't flirting with you. You're using that flirt to make yourself look better by taking me down. She said something like, I tweeted at her or something. I don't know. And it's just like, she, she made fun of me, but you still use my name by making fun of me. So that's like they call clout chasing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's, there's all types of stuff where, you know, someone's talking bad about my movie, but they'll dedicate a whole podcast about it. And they'll use my name in the podcast name to help get a click. So yeah, it's, it's like, clearly you still want to use me. So it's, it's yeah, I have, I definitely lash back, but I'm, I'm not perfect, but I don't really do it very, very, very. I, I rarely, rarely do it now. Well, it's a, it's a but lose. Sometimes you can get yourself on a weekday. It's it's a losing battle. I have a friend, uh, a comic named Joe Madaris, that you know we're from the same town, and he, you know, was on some podcast or something, and then all of a sudden these people didn't like the way he acted, and they just started attacking him and making like a fake account. I got a friend request from a fake account they made for him, then they made a fake account for his wife, and it's like. I mean, he was freaking because he was like you said. It's a it's a group of ninety. You know, it's not like me saying, "Hey, go fuck yourself." It's people coming in, and they all chime in, and they all start this. And it's really it, it's it sucks because it takes away from people who want to actually text, tweet you, and give you a compliment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a good, the good thing is now is we we yeah, we live in a place where. Everybody can get what they want at any time. So you can listen to any music you want on Spotify, watch any videos you want on curated on Netflix or Hulu or YouTube. So there's no reason to watch something you don't like. And if you do, that's on you. And if you don't like it, I guess that's okay. But, like, you have so many choices now that, you know, you can get the news you like. So I'm not I mean... I have this whole fear about criticism is going to be disrupted because I understand the need for critics back then. I don't like them, but it was to save the hard-earned money for the people. That This is what the, the professionals decide you should spend your money on it this weekend at the Cineplex. Well, that's gone. That's gone, man. People can get entertainment whenever they want, however they want. They don't need you. They want to curate it themselves. And that's why I think the critic is going to go away. Well, now, now you've had, you know, such a great career in uh, comedy. Then you started doing dramas. You know, what was that like? What was the transition for you there? Because as you said, you know, you're, you're a guy who likes to have fun. What is it like when you're all of a sudden in, you know, Heartbeat or, you know, the, the, the Whisperer or, you know, even, you know, even Criminal Minds? What's that like for you? Is it just fun? Because you're so used to being a stand-up and this is something completely different. Um, I just love it. I mean, to me, I'd love to do drama more in a way because it's so much unexpected, I think, people think of me, you know. Um, Criminal Minds is just great because I just have to play, and I don't really have to do that much, and that was such a role that no one really expected me to do. So, uh, to me, drama is great because people just are drawn for a loop. But, you know, I love it. Anytime, anytime people, it's like, you know, those are, you know, comedy doesn't, it does get the respect, but it doesn't really get the respect that it should in accordance with other things. It's easier for people to get dramatic love. And I think when you do something dramatic, it's the world that a lot of people want to play in because it is, comes with the respect. And um, I just, I just love it. Now, you're doing a lot of stand-up these days. Um, how has your act grown? 
from when you started out? And do people expect a certain thing because you're Jamie Kennedy if they haven't seen you perform again? I mean, how is your act run? What do you think people expect from you when you're on stage? Uh, yeah, it's done. It's grown a lot more. I've done uh, a new special that's going to come out in about, you know, I don't know, in the next month or two. And, you know, it's kind of like half of the, you know, old me of what people expect, doing some characters and impressions, and then the other half is more talking about social issues and joking on that. And then my next special will be deeper, getting more serious, trying to make good points. Um, so it's just grown. It's, I'm, I'm able to do jokes and be entertaining, but I'm also trying to make more points and not just be escapism. Now... Do you still enjoy it? I mean, like, you know, there's always that high of your first few times. Do you still get that high when you're on stage? I mean, is it something that you really look forward to? Every time. Every time. It's, it's, it's a high. It's exhilarating to go out there. Um, it's exhilarating to feel the crowd. It's exhilarating when you make them laugh. It's, it's a, you know, it's painful when you don't. Um, yeah, it's a live wire every time. It's big or small. It's always out there. That's awesome. Now, now, what's up in the acting front? Any roles coming up? Any uh, movies coming out soon? I just did a just did a, a a movie in the area, not too far, in Bayonne, New Jersey, um, with uh, Bruce Dern and Kathy Moriarty and Jeremy Piven and Taryn Manning. It's called Crabs in a Bucket. And it's actually a movie about the Delco experience. So that is going to probably be, I don't know, in the festival circuit sometime in mid-2020. So we just wrapped that movie. And so that's my next project. And then I'm trying to you know, make my own movies after that. But I'm waiting to see. Well, that's awesome, man. You know, I want to thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy, and uh, I always love talking to Philly guys. Did you go to shows at the Tower when you were young? No, but I used to see the people that were there. It's one of the most legendary places, but I've never really gone. Well, you should play there. You should tape a special there. I know. I would have to. It's about 2,000 seats. I'd have to sell it, but it's one of the most legendary spots. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, what's your Twitter? Tell the people your Twitter. At Jamie Kennedy. Okay, people. So, and then the Jamie Kennedy on Instagram. Okay, so people, go check Jamie out. Uh, check me, follow me, I'm at Cooper Talk. Instagram, Cooper Talk 1. Go to my website, coopertalk.net. I have over 770 episodes up. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. And go on IMDb, look up Jamie. Go check out Pumpkin's Passworks. Go watch his stand-up. I'm sure you can find it. When he plays the clubs, go check him out. He's very funny. So I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next week.